Man, so I'm excited to preach this morning. This is the last sermon of the, the series I've been doing on influence. The first week was about being positioned for influence and about how God has placed us in different places in our lives to be an influence. There are people that you're positioned to influence that I am not positioned to influence. There are people that I'm positioned to influence that you are not positioned to influence. And the whole point of the, the first message was to recognize that we have been positioned somewhere on purpose to be an influence for the kingdom. The second week, Pastor Jason preached on internal influence and how nobody has more influence over you and your condition than yourself. And how if something isn't right here, we got to get it right here. We can't blame it on somebody else. We got to get it right. Last week, I preached on influence in prayer and about how the most important area of influence we have is our influence in prayer. And that if we're not praying, we are missing out on an enormous area of influence to where God can begin to intervene and begin to make things work when you and I have no possibility of fooling with it and making anything happen. He does through prayer. I told you guys a couple of stories when I had been praying for people who were lost. And actually, I started praying that I told you that I used to pray for one of my spiritual daughters, that they would be sin sick and miserable in every situation that causes them to stumble. And I used to pray that their life would be terrible. Well, I'm, I, I kind of ramped that up again this week for a few people because I'm just tired of seeing the enemy kick their behind. So I'm praying that they're just miserable in sin. I mean, miserable, y'all, miserable. Like, like, I hope they live nauseous. Like just the stomach bug all the time. Why? Because I want Jesus to get a hold of their lives and I don't care what it takes for them for him to get them. Amen? But this week, we're doing the last message of this, and I'm excited about this one. Because the Lord, the Lord gave me permission to share some things, y'all, that I didn't think he's going to let me share. So we're just going to go forward. The title of this message is Limitless Influence. Limitless Influence. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to go to verse 15. Everybody knows this story. Before I do that, I want to say this. That many people, especially young people, especially the millennial generation, desire to be involved or be a part of something bigger than themselves. Whether it's philanthropy, I couldn't say the word for a second, philanthropy, whether it's missions, whether it's volunteering, whether it's service. There's this massive push to be involved in something bigger than themselves. Which is why when you notice election campaigns come up, they have so many young people involved and just diving in for their candidate because they're involved in something bigger than themselves. Here's the deal. There is nothing bigger that we can be involved in, in the kingdom of God. Nothing. There's nothing bigger. But a lot of times we don't think that in and of ourselves we have the ability to make influence like this. I want to tell you that there are two requirements, or I should say there are only two things that limit your influence in the kingdom. Number one is a lack of faith, and number two is a lack of obedience. If you don't believe that God can do something with you, he won't. And second of all, if you believe that he'll do something with you and he tells you to do it and you don't do it, he won't do it. It's faith and obedience. Other than that, it's limitless. And we're going to see that this morning. Go to Matthew 14, verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the village and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I just love how Jesus does that. No, they ain't going nowhere. You feed them. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took five loaves and two fish and looked to heaven. And he blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Many of you have heard this story before. I actually preached from this story earlier this year in a different message. But we, we, we know that this story is very popular. Jesus is preaching, and they, they've been out there for a long time, and they're in the middle of, the, of like a deserted place, and so they need to feed the people. Well, we know from John's gospel that this lunch belonged to a little boy. And so what most likely happened, I'm just going to use some, a little bit of, of, of leeway here. I'm going to just go ahead and assume that his mama packed his lunch. His mama, because I'm sure he didn't, right? It, it's too organized. For a little boy to have packed his lunch. Right? So the mama packed the lunch. He got five, lo five pieces five piece of bread and two fish. I don't know about you, but the, the bread that they're talking about is not our slices of bread. It's different types of bread. Different pieces. 
So we're not talking about this enormous amount of food. This little boy's lunch was extremely insignificant compared to the size of the need that the crowd presented. Have you ever felt about this? Have you ever gone somewhere and you've seen a need and you think of yourself and you realize, oh, there's no way I can impact that. If you haven't, you have no compassion. Right? Have you ever gone anywhere? When I went down to Galliano, we were doing the hurricane relief, and I rode down to Galliano, and I saw the condition of some of these houses. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I don't even know where to start helping these people. Like, I can't even begin to figure out what to do. Like, I know they need a roof on that trailer, but do they, should I even put a roof on that trailer? Because it's all wet in the inside, so we'd probably need a new trailer. But how do I get them a new trailer? And then if I help this person, how am I going to help the person next to them, right? Like, it just spirals. And the need gets so enormous. This little boy only had five loaves and two pieces of fish. Yet there are 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So we're, we could probably guess, a safe guess, is this is 15,000 people. That's a safe guess. That's if all the men had their ladies with them and they had one kid. And y'all know they had more than one kid. So we just going to, maybe, maybe some of the guys are working. Maybe it was two kids with a mom. But let's just say it's 15,000 people. This little boy's got five pieces of bread and two fish. And, he's, and the need here is feeding 15,000 people. How did this little boy with this insignificant amount of influence, this insignificant amount of resource, make such an impact? I'm going to give you three things this morning. The first one is he had a willing heart. He had a willing heart. Sometimes we let the fact that our, what we have seems so small disqualify us from even using it. Oh, well, Pastor Chris, I'm not, I can't really do anything. I don't have a lot of money, so I'm not going to give. I don't have much to give, so I'm not going to do it. Or, Pastor Chris, this is my, this is my favorite one just because I'm a musician. My favorite one is, Pastor Chris, I'm not good enough to play for Sunday morning. My thought process is, sweetheart, or sir, do you realize that nobody else in the room except people on a stage can do it at all? So the little bit that you have is a lot better than the 45 people who can't do it at all. But what the enemy likes to do is he likes to take the fact that we have a little and say your little can't do much. Your little is insignificant. It doesn't matter. What does a church of roughly 200 people, how can a church this size impact the world? It's so small. We don't, we don't have this big giant ministry with all this massive amount of re How can we possibly impact the world that's so small? So, you know, we're, we're not going to try. We're not going to try. We're not going to waste all our time and all. No, we're, we're just not going to do it. The enemy loves to do this. The enemy robs believers of using their influence in three ways. He robs them of insecurity, with insecurity. He robs them through doubt, and he robs them through a lack of trust. The insecurity is, I, I'm not enough. I'm, I'm not able to help. I'm in and of my, I have nothing to offer. I'm not good at anything. I can't do anything. What am I going to do? Oh, my goodness, yada, yada, yada. All these poor me, I'm not good enough deals because the enemy has beat people up so much. The second reason is doubt. Now, the difference between insecurity and doubt, doubt, I've got a gift, but I don't think it's going to make a difference. Insecurity is I have nothing to offer. So there are people in church who are insecure the fact that I don't really have anything to do. I can't volunteer for nothing. I can't serve anything. I can't, I can't do anything like that. And then doubt is I got a gift, but what could God do with me? All the stuff that I've done, the mess that I've done, the mistakes that I've made, the choices that I've made, the, my reputation, what people know of me, well, all these different things, God can't use me. And the third one is a lack of trust. Lack of trust is I've got this gift, I've got these resources, but I don't trust what they're going to do with it. Or I don't trust that if I give. Like this is a big one when it comes to, to financial influence, right? Like I've got money to give, but I don't trust that the church is going to do what I think they should do with it. I, I, I don't trust pastors with money, things like that. The enemy uses these three things to rob people of using their influence. When God gave us the influence to use it, we need to be willing to give our influence into the work of the kingdom. Because when our heart is willing, we're going to serve, we're going to give, and we're going to obey when the Lord calls. This little boy had a willing heart. He knew the need was enormous. But he said, I'll help. What you got? Five pieces of bread and two fish. Uh, okay, we'll take it. You ever been that way? We'll take it. You ever had that happen? We'll take it. Right? I don't know, you, you may never have been, I've been that way before. Like, we'll take it. 
I can remember doing youth camp fundraisers and trying to raise kids to go to camp. Went to Panama City one year, and it's going to cost us like 20-something thousand dollars. And somebody came up to me and said, I can give you $25 a month. I'm like, we'll take it. Why? Because 100 hours was a full tank of gas in the van. I'll take it. Boom. But a lot of times we think that God can't use that. Here's the deal. If God can't use it, then why in the world would 2 Corinthians say that my grace is sufficient for thee and my strength is made perfect in your weakness? Why would he ever say that my strength is made perfect in your weakness if he didn't want you to bring the weaknesses? Like, we got to realize something. If there's an area you're not good in, that's where God wants to use you the most. Right? Like, well, Pastor Chris, you're good in front of people. Yo, I have trouble breathing, walking up a flight of stairs. My lungs are not good. You ought to see me try to play basketball. It's, it's, it's like <sighs> just walking on the court. So the fact that I can get up here and sing and preach, he's using my weakness to magnify his strength. But we don't give the weaknesses because we're insecure. I don't want anybody to see my weakness. I don't want anybody to see that. I don't want anybody to know about it. No, 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 no. He says, um, you realize, you, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but he created your weaknesses on purpose. You do realize that, right? Like you were created with that weakness because he said, now, nah, see, see, I, I'm going to use Raph's weakness in this. I'm a, I put that there so I can be strong in it. Because if everybody was strong in everything, we wouldn't need him. Amen? So we got to have a willing heart. The little boy had his willing heart. I don't have much, but you could have it. The second one, this is going to be the fun one. This is the one I've been praying about for months. This is how, I'm, how this is going to happen. Because the Lord's speaking to me, showing me all kinds of things this year. The second point is the little boy was connected correctly. He was connected correctly. Now we see here, let's go real quick. I want to read it to you again. Verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they might go to the village and buy themselves some food. Jesus said, give them, you give them something to eat. Then they said to him, we have. I don't know about you. The disciples never had the, the food. The little boy had the food. It's pretty presumptuous of the disciples to say, we have. No, the reason that we had is because the little boy was connected to the disciples. He took his resources and he connected it to the people who knew how to use it the best, who were in a position to make the most of it. See, what we have to understand, I want to go to Psalm 92, 13 real quick. Through 15. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age and they shall be fresh and flourishing. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. The little, this little boy had the right heart and he had some influence, resources. But at first he was not connected to the need. Hear me out. This is what I mean by that. This little boy is in the same field as all these people. He's hearing the same sermon as all these people. But he's got a lunch. And he knows that all these people around him don't have a lunch. He knows. He sees the problem. This is what's wrong. And I've got these resources. But in and of himself, he did not know how to take his resources and apply it to the need. How many of you right now, if I gave you the microphone and I said, tell me one need that you see right now that you have a passion to reach. You could give me one right now. Raise your hand. I see, there's a need, I got to help right now, I can see it, I can, right? But what happens is we look at the resources we have and we do the math and we're like, I don't know how my resources are ever going to be able to be involved in that. Like I'm not connected to that need. I don't have a way to be connected to it. What the little boy did was he connected his influence to Peter, James, John, the disciples. They represent the church. They, he was connected to the church. Let me, let me tell you something. The local church is the greatest hope that America has right now. Through Jesus, obviously. But the local church is it. Y'all, America is going 95 miles an hour to the edge of a cliff when it comes to morality. Like speeding that way. There are, there are, there are people running our nation off the side of a mountain and smiling while it's happening. And the last... Great hope for the United States of America is not a politician. It's not Donald Trump. It's not the Republican Party. It's the praying and believing saints of God connected to the local church. That's what it is. But the problem is, here, you know what the problem is? The is, is the enemy's got these small local churches so deceived in the fact that they can't make an impact that they're not even trying. 
But we got to be connected. And it says that those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. They shall bear fruit in old age. You got to understand something. When you're planted in the house of the, house of the Lord's church, when you're planted in the house of the Lord, you shall flourish. There's a difference between bearing fruit and flourishing. You know that, right? I have two fruit trees in my backyard. I have a navel orange tree and I have a lemon tree. And this year, the hurricane and the cold we had last year and then the hurricane made a freeze that messed them up. Then the hurricane kind of beat them up. But last year, I had this navel orange tree. And this navel orange tree, they produ- I mean, I get some big old orange off this thing. But I only had about 25 of them. My lemon tree, I, I didn't even get to pick them all. They had some. I had about 500 lemons on this one tree. See, my navel orange tree was bearing fruit, but my lemon tree was flourishing. Y'all, there's a whole lot of people who believe in Jesus who were just bearing fruit when they could be flourishing. Why? Because they're not planted in the house of the Lord. See, but what's happening is the enemy right now is attacking the church. He's attacking the church. Whether we realize it or not, turn on the news. He's attacking the church. The disciples position themselves, being the ones doing the work of the ministry, making sure this happened. I want to share a couple of things with you that the Lord has taught me this year, really the last two years, about the church. Can I do that? Thank you. The first thing that the Lord has been showing me, like I said, the enemy is after the local church, and COVID caused churches to ramp up their online presence due to the shutdown. Right? Like, all of a sudden, I remember having meetings, trying to figure out how in the world to not look stupid on Facebook Live because I hate watching myself preach. I hate seeing myself on camera and I had to do it every week. And so I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. We had meetings and like people were like, you got to make sure the camera angle is on the right spot. I'm like, y'all, I'm thinking about the sermon. I ain't thinking about the camera angle. Like no matter what angle the camera is, I'm not gonna be good looking. So just put it somewhere and let's just, let's just go for it. Right? Well, we had to up our presence, but what happened is the enemy took that as an opportunity to make it easier for people to stay home. The enemy made it easier now for people to stay home because all these churches had to ramp up their online presence. Now, hear me out. If you're watching online, don't take this as a shot. I'm not knocking you for watching online. People are sick. They stay home. They live out of state. We have people who watch us from out of state, which is fine. I get that. But this is the bottom line. There is a reason that the Bible wants us to not forsake getting together in the physical. Because something happens when we get together and we worship and we pray and we, we, we love on each other and we fellowship together. Something simply happens. But what the enemy is doing is he's isolating people and he's getting them separated because what happens, y'all have seen them Discovery Channel? What happens to the antelope that gets isolated from the rest of the pack? Y'all know? Them lions and hyenas tear him up. But you've all seen it. You've seen the one where the little baby elephant gets, gets a little lost and, and the mama elephant finds it and they show up and they circle them. There's Christians right now going through hell, but because they're not connected to the local church, they don't have the rest of the family circling them. They don't have the rest of people gathering around them. Let me tell you something. There have been situations I've been through in my life that if I would not have had people circling around me, keeping the enemy off of me, giving me a little break, letting me breathe a little, if I didn't have people cooking me dinner, I'd have lost my ever-loving mind. But what happened is I was connected to the local church. And guess, you know what that does? All that does is makes me your brother and your sister. I am no different because I stand up here. I am your brother in the Lord just as much as your mind. There is no, and actually 2 Timothy says that if you're older than me, you're my father and you're my mother. And if you're younger than me, you're my sister and my brother. So I got a lot of mom and dads in this room because I'm pretty young. But what I'm saying is that I'm still connected and you're connected. How many of you right now could give me a testimony about being connected to the local church? Raise your hand. To be able to say, no, God did something through the body of Christ that would not have happened if I wouldn't have been connected to it. I'm telling you, it's not just people throw around that we're we're two or three are gathered together in his name. He's there in the midst. That scripture has nothing to do with corporate worship. Not all. It's out of context. But the whole point is here. And we are able to be the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 12 says, who can, can the foot say to the hand, we don't need you? Well, there's churches all across the country that the hand isn't even coming anymore. The hand's sitting at home. I want to encourage you. In Jesus' name, hashtag, make church a priority again. Where it's a priority. 
I'm, I'm, again, I'm just, I'm just saying it because I see it and the enemy is beating up the church right now. Y'all, I know it's pretty outside. It is, right? It's pretty outside. But guess when it's going to be pretty? At 1230. It's still going to be pretty. Right? Like, it ain't that much prettier at 1030 compared to 1230. The zoo will still be open. The restaurants are still going to be there. Right? It's, it is what it is. But church has now become this, as I said a few weeks ago, like prayer. It's become this accessory. It's become an item of convenience, not a matter of priority. Y'all, we got people who drive over an hour to come to church here. And that people around the corner can't come. No, no, no. It needs to be a priority. Why? Not so we can say we have a big church. No, so the family's bigger. So when you're going through hell, you got that many more people ready to jump in the ring and fight for you. Amen? This is one of the other things the Lord's been showing me is that the church is not supposed to feed us. Church ain't supposed to feed us. I've heard this statement so many times, Pastor, I just wasn't getting fed at that church. I just wasn't getting fed at that church. No, you wasn't reading your Bible is what the problem was. That's the problem. You weren't spending time with Jesus. Ready? There's this really popular prayer, you know, like Jesus prayed it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our what bread? Day. Pastor it don't say weekly bread? No. It says daily bread. If you're not getting fed, it's because you're not getting the daily portion he has for you. It's not because your pastor don't preach good. Y'all, if it was my job to feed you, I'd be, that's all, I, all I would do would preach. I'd preach seven days a week, two times a day, if I had to feed you. But there are so many Christians who the only time they eat is when the pastor cooks. You gotta understand something. First off, I'm not as good of a cook as the Holy Spirit, ever, ever. My best sermon is like garbage. Like he throws them notes, he doesn't even put them, he doesn't write them down. Like my sermons, all, like as a preacher, you putting your message together and like thoughts come in your mind and like that don't really fit and you toss it. All my sermons are like that to him. Like, eh, that ain't worth it. He's got so much better for you. Give us this day our daily bread. People tell me all the time, Pastor Chris, you speak right to me. Your message hit me right in the face. The Holy Spirit will do that every single day. Every day. But what happens is people say, oh, I'm not getting fed at that church. So I'm going to go to this one. I'm not getting fed at that church. So I'm going to go to this one. The truth is, is that it's not that you're not being fed. It's that you're not comfortable there. Because we've now made attending church like buying an outfit. How does this one fit me? Does my butt look big? If I wash it, is it going to shrink? We, what we do is, is we, we look at church and we see what, what can this church do for me? What, what, what is this ministry going to do for me? And it's because of the consumerism in the United States and the Western society has turned church attendance into church shopping. Let me tell you what the church is supposed to be. The church is not supposed to be something that feeds you. It's supposed to be something that equips you, empowers you, and releases you. That's what our job is. That is my job as the pastor. My job is to equip you. My job is to empower you. And my job is to release you into the purpose and the fullness of what God has for you. But what's happened is so many people attend church because it makes me feel good. Or the kids are great. I'm not saying that you should not enjoy going to church. I'm not saying there should not be good kids things. I'm not saying, no. But if you're going to church because you like the way that I preach only... You probably haven't prayed about where you're supposed to be going to church. Like, like I'm serious. Like, I talked to somebody, they, a friend of mine moved to a different city several years ago. And I said, y'all going to a church? Yeah, we're, we're going to go check a few out. No, pray first. And then when you're praying, God's probably going to knock off a few of the churches that you don't need to be in through prayer alone. This buddy of mine moved out of state, moved to Arizona or something like that. It was Arizona. And they, we just couldn't find a church. What? You mean to tell me, in the United States of America, in a metropolitan area, you couldn't find one church? Oh, that's right. You couldn't find one church that did what you wanted them to do. You couldn't find a church that made you feel a certain kind of way. 
No, the church is supposed to equip us, empower us, and send us. That's what the church is supposed to do. You're not supposed to get fed in church. We get fed in the morning with Jesus every single day. If I'm not feeding you well enough, it's because I'm not preaching to you every day. I'm not supposed to feed you. This pulpit's not supposed to feed you. Amen? Okay, something else, right? This kind of continues. The analogy in Scripture used most for church people or Christians is shepherds. I mean, sheep and pastors are used as shepherds. Ready for a newsflash? Ready for this? I'll learn this one. Shepherds don't pick their sheep, and sheep don't pick their shepherds. Shepherds don't pick their sheep, and sheep don't pick their shepherds. I didn't pick to pastor this church. I didn't pick to pastor. That wasn't a decision made by men. Because you see, the sheep don't pick the shepherd, and the shepherd don't pick the sheep. The owner of the herd assigns shepherds to certain flocks based upon the needs of the flock and the skills of the shepherd. But what has happened is we have sheep picking shepherds and shepherd picking sheep and not checking with the landowner. And we wonder why there's so many incomplete, unfulfilled, struggling churches all across this country. It's because sheep are picking shepherds and shepherds are picking sheep. The bottom line is this is I do not, hear me out. I don't want someone coming to church here if God don't want you coming to church here. Because I can promise you, the moment that God says I'm done as pastor of this church, I'm done. Because I'm not gonna be in the way of what God's trying to do. I did that in youth ministry. I knew my time was done. You know why I knew my time was done? Because I was trying to preach to teenagers and I was having a harder time preaching to teenagers than I was preaching to adults. And the sermons for the adults were deeper. I was having a hard time teaching young people. And as soon as the decision was made that Pastor Jason and Melanie were taking over, I sat down with them and I said, tell me what you want me to preach. And tell me what you want me to do. Why? Because I don't have it anymore. You do. See, God does this. Everybody's been quoting Romans 13 right now as this thing with the government. Proper hermeneutics. Romans 13 is not talking about civil government. Why? Because if you read Romans 12 and you read Romans 14, it's talking about the church. So Romans 13 applies to church government. All leaders are appointed by God. That's church government. It's so important that we're connected to the right place. We're connected to the right body. We're connected to the right people. Why? Because God's got gifts in you that maybe this body needs. But God might have gifts in you that another body needs. We don't know. That's why we have to pray and seek the face of God. Because here's the deal. While the church is playing church, the enemy's not playing church. He's waging war. So the church is playing games and the enemy's fighting war. That's why he hates the church so much. So as long as he can keep sheep picking shepherds and shepherds picking sheep and people thinking church is about feeding me and taking care of me, he's winning because he knows that the church is the last great hope for this nation. And if he can keep us chasing our own tail on Sunday mornings from 10 to 12, then we're going to miss out on an opportunity to change the city. I'm here to tell you, I'm not interested in just hanging out with you for an hour or two on Sunday mornings. I'm interested in that when we're done, when our season of the Tabernacle Church in St. Bernard Parish is done, that this parish looks different, that it talks different, that it sounds different, and that it smells different in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he did not put me here to entertain anybody. He didn't put me here to make somebody feel good. He put me here to be who God wanted me to be when he wanted me to be it for his glory and his glory glory alone and I'm believing that there's going to be people who are going to say you know what Pastor Chris I don't even like the way you preach but my goodness there's an anointing in this house and I won't be a part of it this little boy was connected correctly some of you you're struggling with how can I be used what can I do I got all this desire but you're not connected because in your mind you're thinking that the church isn't going to let me do what I want to do no pause time out There are connections, there are resources, there are things that we have that you can be a part of, but you just got to say, here I am, a willing heart. Because see, the boy had a willing heart, and he was connected correctly, but the third part of this is that Jesus got his hands on it. 
Jesus got his hands on. See, you can have a willing heart and you can be connected correctly, but something happens when Jesus gets his hands on your resources, when he gets his hands on your influence. Now, look at verse 19. Verse 18, it says, and he said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took, say he took. Let me tell you something, my influence can only go so far. After the hurricane, there was no food down here. I made a phone call, and I got 150 meals, and we were able to serve the meals. Some of y'all helped, it was fantastic. When it was right after the hurricane, we're running out of gas. There was no gas. I made a phone call. Somebody blessed us with 100 gallons of gasoline. It was amazing. But, y'all, 150 meals, 300 gallons of gasoline for a city of 50,000 people is like a drop in the bucket. Right? My, my influence and my resources, they, they're tapped out. They have a limit that I can do. And it doesn't matter how many phone calls I can make, how many people I know. If I could call the president of the United States, his resources are tapped out or his resources are limited because he can't do nothing for the soul of a man. But see, something happens when my influence, no matter how big or how small it is, when Jesus gets his hands on it. It says that Jesus took it. There's a lot of people who don't want to give their influence up because they don't want Jesus to take it. They want to take it. They want to do something with it. They want to be the one that decides how it happens. Hear me out. Jesus is the cook. Jesus is the one in charge. Jesus is the guy that does what he's going to do because he's the one that knows what's got to get done. So Jesus takes it and then he blesses it. He breaks it and he gives. There's always a process. Your influence and your resources always go through a process before they're actually used. Why? Because Jesus has to bless it, and he's got to break it, and he's got to give it. He's got to get it ready for distribution. Because even if you have enough, you got to make sure you give it the right way. But the bottom line is Jesus takes this stuff. And all of a sudden, what seemed so insignificant... When looking at, like I said, 5,000 men, let's just say 15,000 people, it looks so insignificant for 15,000 people, went from being so small and seemingly useless to being more than enough. The only way that happens is when Jesus gets his hands on it. The only way this little bit becomes more than enough with leftovers is because Jesus gets his hands on it. Because I don't know about you, but I can't create things out of thin air. I do not possess that ability. He does. And he does it. I've been in the room for a food multiplication. We had a meeting here. Jar was there. We had a few of us were here. We had a meeting years ago. A missionary named David Hogan came to the church and they wanted jambalaya. So Brother Ray Gremion cooked jambalaya. And he cooked jambalaya for 30 people. Because that's what people were supposed to have. And 70 showed up. And I walk over to Brother Ray. I was waiting in the end to eat. Let everybody else eat first. I walk up to him and he said, he said Brother Chris, come here. Come here. He's crying because it's all he did. He cried all the time. Just crying. Come see. And he comes over and he says, watch this. Watch this. I'm like, what? He's like, I cook for 25 people. There's like 70. He, watch. And he'd scoop the jambalaya, put it on the plate. And he'd go back and he'd scoop the same spot again. Over and over again. And we, we're both just <laughs> stare. We fed everybody. And there was still stuff left over in the pot. Yo, I'm talking about a pot this big. Fed 70 people, most of them men, jambalaya. Ladies, you know what? It don't work. It don't happen. And if you know Brother Ray, Brother Ray was, was nervous. He didn't want to run out. But we watched as God took the little bit of resource, the little bit of influence, and said, all I need is that. I just need the obedience. Just give it to me. Watch. A few weeks ago, we had the, the gifts for the Mama Tower Orphanage in Honduras. If you remember, they asked to fill them little boxes or take the card and do a $25 gift card for one of the volunteers. Now, hear me out for a second. $25 in the United States for Christmas is like one gift. And it's for the, and we're going to be real because we all know it's, and that's the gift for the people kind of at the bottom of your list. Right? Like you, your kids are not getting just 25 bucks spent on them, Right? That $25 gift is for the cousin you really like, but you don't know if you're supposed to buy him something, so you get him something small anyway. That, that gift, right? You're all kind of nodding your head awkwardly because you don't want your family in the room to see that you're nodding. 
because you know you do that for them. That's what I'm talking about, right? It's that person you kind of got to buy a gift for, but you don't know if you should. It's $25, right? In Honduras, that's a whole Christmas. It's a whole Christmas. Through, through, through the Surge Project that we partner with whenever we can. We, we may, I'm working on where it's a constant partnership monthly. But right now, it's whenever we have enough, we give to it. Somebody, real quick, how much does it cost to go to Disney for four days? Five grand, right? Let's just go with five grand. Five grand. Wow. it's a lot of money. Wow. That's a four-day trip in Disney World. For $3,000, you can plant a church overseas. A church like this. I mean, it doesn't look like this, but what we have here, the fellowship that we have here, the community that we have here, the atmosphere that we have here is $3,000. I'm going to let you all know, in case you didn't know, this did not cost $3,000. No. No. But what he does is God takes what you might think is a little. And when it's connected correctly. To the church. And then Jesus gets his hands on it. What seems so small in your realm of thinking. Becomes so much bigger when God gets his hands on it. This is why it's so important to be involved in missions. In case you didn't know. When you go online you could scroll down the little things. Little tabs you can give. There's lighthouse missions. We're supporting 14 missionaries right now every month. Whether somebody gives to it or not, we're sending missions out every month. People overseas, we support one man who is right now still working with his contacts in China because he can't get in because of COVID. He's still working with the pastors of the house churches he planted in China. He's still involved in it. Why? Because the kingdom doesn't stop just because of inconveniences. But our giving supports that. We support something called Global Roar that helps plant Bible schools in foreign country. Did you know that two years ago, our missions helped plant a Bible school in Mongolia? That's training pastors to go plant local churches in Asia. And you may think, man, Pastor Chris, my, my $25 for missions a month don't seem like a whole lot. No, for you, that's like three Starbucks drinks. Right? But if you take that $25 and we connect it correctly and let Jesus get his hand it, it just might bring water to an entire village in Africa. But see, we don't think that way. Because all we see is the amount of what we have. All we see is the minuscule resources that we have. I know when I was younger, before I was giving it to missions monthly, I used to think I don't have enough to give to missions monthly. I don't have enough to give. Then I was at a conference. And I heard a story of a man. This is still one of the craziest mission stories I've ever heard in my life. This man... Asked, he was in, a, uh, in the central Africa, he was in, going into the jungles, and you, there were no roads. You couldn't get there by vehicle. You could only take a motorbike. You couldn't take a truck. And they were trying to figure out how to get pastors and get people to plant churches in this whole jungle area, but they couldn't figure out how to do it. So this African pastor who had been trained through the, product, the, the, the team or whatever says, give me a motorcycle. So for $2,400, they bought this man a motorcycle. He left, rode into the jungle, and came back two years later, planted 48 churches. And came back because his bike was giving him trouble. Bought him another motorcycle for $2,400, and he went back in and planted 30 more. $2,400. We could raise that right now without even taking out of our lunch money. Because we live in the most prosperous nation on the planet. But we don't think that my $25, $30, my $50 makes a difference. What I'm telling you is it doesn't make a difference if you're the one trying to use it. But when you connect it correctly with a willing heart and Jesus gets his hands on it, it is limitless. We have limitless influence in the kingdom. Limitless. Because of him. Because of Jesus. We have limitless influence. I want you to stand with me this morning. We'll close a little differently this morning. If I, if I took the time, and, and tonight's not the moment, for, and today, tonight, today's not the moment for it. But if I just took a minute and begin to share with you some of the stuff that God's been showing me and putting on my heart to do 
leading me to start doing, it would seem so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. I'll give you one of them right now. I'm not sure how it's going to happen. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It's going to have to happen soon. But I don't know if you know this, but we are at capacity in all of our kids' building, our kids' rooms. Like, ask anybody who volunteers in nursery or the toddler room, and it's absolutely insane. And in case you haven't noticed, we got a whole lot of pregnant people and people who just have babies, right? And they're not, and we, we got Jason Mount wanted to make sure we were ahead too. Thanks. No. Um, and can you imagine the snacks going to eat? They come out looking like Jason. I mean, my gosh. I can say that about Jason. Jason loves me. But we're at capacity. Our kids' ministry needs two services. They do. But we don't. So one day I'm sitting in this room in the back, and I'm asking God, I'm like, God, what are we going to do? And God says, you're going to build a building. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Huh. Me? No, I'll lead the song at the meeting to talk about building a building. But I ain't building a building. He said, no, you're going to build a building. Two weeks later, I'm sitting down with a contractor and an architect and a contractor in that room, and he's laying out what it's going to take to build a building. I don't know when we're going to do it, but I'm telling you, when I pull in the parking lot now, I see a million-dollar children's facility right off to the side of this property. Why? Because this church is reaching young families, and young families have kids. And the last thing that I want to have happen is a family coming to church here, but they can't stay because we can't fit their kids. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how. No idea. But all I know is, is that I have a willing heart. And I'm connected correctly. And he's going to take my five loaves and my two fish. And he's going to feed 5,000 people. So if you're here this morning, you could say, Pastor Chris, I, I got five loaves and two fish. Because you all do. Hear me out. Every single one of you in here, you have five fish. Your five loaves and two fish might be playing the guitar. Your five loaves and two fish might be being knowing how to work with numbers really well. Your five loaves and two fish might be that you can do anything with your hands. You can build anything. Your five loaves and two fish might be you are the best nursery worker that the world has ever seen. That's your five loaves and two fish. And you may think, I don't know how I could use it. No, you don't need to figure out how. You just need to bring it to Jesus. That's all you got to do is bring it to Jesus. Y'all, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world when you take a gift that doesn't seem like it could do much and God explodes it and does something so much bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. When I became a youth pastor in 2009, there were 30 kids in the youth group and I didn't even know how to preach every week. I didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. All I knew was that I had to be on my face at the feet of Jesus as much as I possibly could because I knew teenagers needed Jesus. And somehow, he took my five loaves and two fish and now he's got me positioned in a place of influence where we're doing a youth conference in Louisiana next year, in Chicago next year, and training youth pastors in North Carolina. Why? Because he took my five loaves and two fish and did something with it I never could. But I had a willing heart. This morning, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I'm, if, if, you're, if you mean it, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to say, God, my heart's willing. Just give him your willing heart right now. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter what you're walking through right now in this moment. Say, God, I got a willing heart. I have a willing heart. I don't know what I'm going to bring. I don't know what I have to offer. But whatever I've got, I'm willing to use it. You can have it. I'm willing, God. The second thing we're going to pray real quick is say, Jesus, connect me. Connect me. If this is where God is leading you to come to church or you're here, this is your church, then make sure you're connected. Make sure you're in a life group. Make sure you're serving. Make sure you're plugged in. Why? Because you got to be connected correctly or the need you see will never get your resources. It'll never get your influence. And lastly, I want you to lift your hands and say, Jesus, take everything I've got. Say, Jesus, just take everything I've got. I don't, it ain't much, but it's a lot with you. You could take the little bit that I've got. Lord, I've been serving the Lord four weeks. That's okay. There's a city of people who don't even know him yet. 
Well, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. It's okay. We'll tell you. I, I, Lord, I, I don't even know what to do. I, I don't work. I, I don't have a job. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in financial trouble. Can you serve food? Because there's 300 men that need to eat this week. It's that simple. Father, just connect us. Get your hands on our gifts and use them for your glory. Father, I thank you for every person in here. I thank you for every willing heart. God, I thank you that you're teaching us to be connected to you in the right way. God, that we're not coming to church to be fed, but we're coming to church to be equipped and empowered and sent. Father, I thank you right now, God, that you're, you're going to take this church and raise us into a position of influence. God, that we could never even begin to thank.